Thank you all for arriving on time, both um, platform and audience. Um, my name is David Goodhart from Policy Exchange, and um, we're debating um, free speech, social media issues, one of, the, one of the big issues of the day has emerged just really in the last few years. Um, we all, um, it seems to be the new consensus that politics has become far more polarized and aggressive and uh, uncivil or incivil? Incivil, I think. Um, and clearly, social media has something to do with that. The medium has clearly shaped the message in all sorts of ways. And if politics is in part about finding common ground between conflicting values and views and interests, then, then um, it's clearly become a bit harder to do politics in a civil way. Um, in fact, we had a, a, a small example of this. We did an event on this subject, uh, or a related subject, at the Labour Party conference um, a week or so ago. Um, and um, I was pointing out um, an, an example of the inability to accept that your political opponents might also have perfectly decent motives. I pointed out uh, the famous quote from John McDonnell about how Grenfell was murder, the Grenfell Tower accident was murder. Um, and um, about well, a sizable minority of the people in the room said it was murder. I mean, you know, as an example of just how polarized um, discussion about um, political and social events has become, I think that was rather a striking example. Now, obviously, this is not just about um, uh, the way in which technology, um, the, the, the anonymity of social media has, has made it easier to um, abuse those that you disagree with. Um, but that clearly is one of the, the issues that needs to be discussed. Is it possible, is it desirable or, or possible to make anonymity in social media easier? Uh, there are all sorts of difficulties with it. And of course, some people um, would say that we're all being a little bit feeble, that actually this is just all a new version of the rough and tumble of politics. Um, and that indeed, in some ways, the, our public space has been opened up by the new technologies. We no longer have the kind of the filters and controls that, that used to control the public debate. Um, and that that must be a healthy thing in many ways. Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, lots, of, lots of big issues. Um, you know, what's going on in our universities too, of course. Um, and we have um, Sam Gima to my, on the far right, who is, of course, um, MP for East Surrey. Um, I'm comfortable here, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's time that that, um, that that joke was dropped, I think. Um, <laughs> Um, Minister, of course, for um, Minister of State for Universities and Research, um, and he will be particularly talking about the, the university free speech issue. To my immediate right, um, Chloe Smith, MP for Norwich North, um, who has the very grand title of Minister for the Constitution, um, as she pointed out, Minister for something that doesn't exist. Um, um, to my immediate left is uh, William Shawcross, who is... Um, former head of the Charity Commission and biographer, of course, of the Queen Mother, oh. who died, unfortunately, before Twitter was invented. Um, otherwise, we might have enjoyed lots of very we would, fruity we would have tweets it. from the Queen Mother. Um, <laughs> and to my far left is Kate Proctor, who is a political reporter on the Evening Standard. So um, everybody's going to talk just for five minutes or so, five to seven minutes, and uh, then maybe we'll have a bit of discussion intra-panel discussion and then um, we will open it up to, 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 to you guys. Um, so Chloe has volunteered to go first. I have drawn, drawn tonight's short straw, which is to, uh, which is to, to go first. But uh, David, thank you. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have this kind of quality of discussion with Policy Exchange, but also with, with such a good panel. Uh, and of course, with the audience, who I'm sure you will prove yourselves to be uh, more than equal to this, uh, this tricky topic. A couple of things I'd like to uh, put out there as starting points for the debate. The first is this. There is such a thing as intimidation and abuse in uh, politics. I'm going to start by pegging out that position, that there is such a thing uh, as a, a line that can be crossed, um, and there is such a thing as damage that can be done to uh, our democratic discourse uh, by, by that. 
Now, um, I do say this from the perspective of being the minister responsible for electoral regulations, so uh, I have a particular a particular sort of depth of, 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 of kind of policy angle that I'll, I'll be very happy to try to bring into the discussion uh, this afternoon, whilst Sam, I'm sure, will bring up some more of the kind of campus-related, educational-related aspects. Um, but yes, there is such a thing as damage that can be done to our politics. Um, this consists of old things as well as new things. This isn't actually only new in the age of social media. We live in the age of social media, so by all means, let's discuss it from where we live. But, but it isn't actually uh, only um, done by new methods. The old ones are still just as good. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief anecdote um, from uh, actually only walking along the street this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure you all saw some of the uh, bollocks to Brexit uh, people um, going around. And I just happened to be walking along behind a chap who, uh, who took it as good as he got and said, shut up, you bellend. And I just thought, well, you know, you don't need to add that, that word at the end. I mean, actually, you could have had a, a fairly reasonable level of discussion there. You could have stopped and had a half an hour ins and outs of the thing. But, you know, he, his choice was to add, uh, add a word at the end, which, uh, which I'm sure to some qualifies um, as abuse. Now, probably that's the kind of thing that stays one side of the threshold we're talking about. There's stuff that goes well over the threshold. We have, after all, had an MP murdered in recent British political history. Um, a, uh, an example I could offer from my own uh, work in my own constituency, I for one have been um, pursued through a dark underground car park by some people who happen to be of a different political opinion to me. That's the kind of stuff that goes over a line. So my point, first point is there is uh, such a thing as intimidation and abuse, there is such a thing as a line, but you can go over that line in old ways as well as in new, in new ways. Um, I also think uh, we don't need to freshly define this stuff. So it is very interesting to go into uh, what the definition of, is of free speech, but actually we have quite an established body of law on this, uh, and we have quite an effective array, actually, of uh, criminal offences that already exist. I don't, uh, I don't take the view that we need to add, uh, that we need to add a new one, and I, and I say that in particular uh, with reference to election time. So I, I mentioned that uh, um, I have the, the privilege of being the Minister for Electoral Law, and there's a, a piece that I've been... Um, <coughs> consulting on recently that I'm hoping to be able to, to, to bring in, which is a new, uh, new offence in electoral law that uh, says it's not okay to do uh, things over this line. It's not acceptable to go around intimidating uh, campaigners, candidates, indeed voters during election times. But what I'm going to do with that is say that that attaches to the existing criminal offences. So I'm not trying to say we need a new definition of free speech. We actually already have that, and it's uh, robust and it works, so let's go from there. The third point I want to make is that we should put voters at the heart of this. So I think, Dave, you, David, you, you, you hinted at this in your intro, that um, is there a point at which we in politics just have to put up with some stuff? To a small extent, yes, although I've already covered the point that I think there is a line that, that, that gets crossed. But the real people who get damaged when that line cro is crossed is voters and citizens. Because in fact, it's our democratic um, uh, debate, it's the quality of our discussion, it's the way we all relate to each other in society. It's a bit intangible, sure, but that's where it really matters. So it really matters uh, individually and collectively and, and kind of structurally for voters that we, uh, that we stand up to the idea that there is uh, intimidation and abuse in politics that is damaging. The final thing I just wanted to open as perhaps a, 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 a thread that we might pursue in, in later debate is that this is nonetheless very hard to, to discuss and define at this time. You only need to look over the water at the, uh, the Kavanaugh um, saga that, that is opening up in the United States to see how difficult it is fundamentally to have any such thing as a kind of settled cultural position. I mean, that's just not going to be the case, I think, for a number of years in the US. And you're talking about the really big things there. You're talking about principles of, you know, the very principles of justice that are being contested. Um, and, and it's very difficult in the age of social media when there is, after all, uh, a, a, a voice and argument and, and <coughs> the power to, to argue from every direction. One of the things that is true about us living in the age of social media is that it becomes inherently so much harder 
to find a settled position, actually on almost anything, but, uh, but certainly on these very big issues uh, that, include, uh, that include justice and free speech. I hope that is helpful as a starting point for tonight's discussion. Uh, it, it is indeed. Thank you very much. And I, I should have said at the beginning, uh, uh, and particularly as this is a social media um, subject we're discussing, that we uh, would encourage people to tweet using the hashtag um, PXCivility. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, very <coughs> PXCivility. Very nice. Um, very nice hashtag. Um, anyway, over to you, Sam. Well, David, thank you. Um, I think this is the inaugural policy exchange uh, event at this party conference. It is a pleasure uh, to be here, and thank you all for coming. And um, during David's introductory remarks, he said, there's Sam, who's sitting on my far right, and I said, I'm comfortable here, and he said, it's about time we drop that joke. But I was actually making a serious point, uh, a serious point in the context of free speech, which is one of the ways in which people shut down debate is by labeling the other side as something extreme and unacceptable. And therefore, that becomes a reason for censorship. And that is what goes to the heart of the free speech debate. Now, when I became a university's minister, I decided to go on a tour of campuses around the country to listen and talk directly to students. And um, my good friends who are in the journalism trade, a few of them texted me and said, are you sure about this? you should take security with you. Journalists do care. And um, I said, oh, no, it's fine. I'll go along again. So I've, I've spoken to about 1,700 students in the last uh, six months um, about free speech and a whole range of political issues. <clears throat> and so I will look at this debate mainly within the context of universities. And the first thing I will say is I don't believe that universities are some kind of left-wing madrasas, as some commentators <laughs> have said. It, it should be come as no surprise to people that a lot of young people tend to be quite left-wing, right? That happens. It should come as no, and I think um, I can see Seb Payne at the back there, and he wrote a brilliant piece at the last party conference charting when people became conservative, and I think the age of 19 is not when that started. It actually started much later um, yeah. in uh, their life. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. We shouldn't be surprised that students tend to be anti-establishment and anti particularly whatever the government is. So they might be against the Conservative government for austerity. They were definitely against the Blair government of Iraq. None of those two things should surprise us. So what is the issue when it comes to free speech on campus that I have identified? And I think what it is, it's a culture where a tolerance for dissenting views and the space to have a dissenting view is getting narrower and narrower. So you want universities to be an assault on the census. Universities should be the place where there should be a search for truth. And you cannot have a search for truth unless you allow contentious debate. But if what is happening in our universities is some ideas are acceptable and can be debated, and some ideas are not acceptable because you've labeled them as, say, far right, then you've got a problem. And so what we've got is a creeping culture of censorship, mainly around intolerance. And I'll make three points. The first is around rigor. If you want free speech, you've got to have rigor. And rigor means you debate issues on their merits. You debate issues on, based on the facts. But what you begin to have is people not even debating issues, <coughs> condemning and asking for a retraction when they disagree with something. And what that does is it narrows the space for free speech. If just by the sheer fact of saying something, someone doesn't come up with a contrary argument to dispute what you're saying, but can demand that you retract it, that is not rigor. And what we want is we want rigor to be at the heart of the debates that are happening in our universities. What you want is a fact-based discussion rather than an emotion-based discussion where we discuss contentious issues. So if you want free speech, by which I mean legal free speech, rigor has got to be at the heart of the debate. And I think that is one of the issues that I'm identifying on campus, this sort of culture of condemning and asking for a retraction rather than challenging and debating someone else. The second issue is what I'll call diversity of viewpoint. It should be totally acceptable for people to hold diverse views that are within the law and have them debated. And here in the UK, we actually have very strict laws around free speech. 
right? We've got hate speech laws, we've got harassment laws, you, they've got the public sector equality duty. I mean, there are lots of laws around free speech. So you should be able to have free speech within the law. But increasingly, you begin to see that there are certain views that are seen as unacceptable. They're unacceptable because they're not in fashion. They're unacceptable because it's not what people want to hear, or they're unpopular, and people object to them. And I'll just give one small example. At a number of universities, they have something called Israel Apartheid Week. And during Israel Apartheid Week, what they do is they erect mock checkpoints where they sort of go through what, how bad the experience is. And this causes a huge offense and upsets Israeli and Jewish students saying, yes, of course we should be debate these issues, but you don't need to go that far. Now, imagine someone saying, let's have an honor killing week. That would be totally unacceptable. It would be unacceptable. I'm not saying that it should be done because that is not seen as part of the prevailing view that is accepted. And what I would say is if you want genuine free speech around these issues, you should discuss Burma and the Rohingya crisis. You should discuss Pakistan. You should discuss what's happening in Saudi Arabia. There are much broader issues that you can discuss rather than singling out one issue that you find acceptable rather than one that you do not find acceptable. And that is what I mean by diversity of viewpoint. But you also have an issue of a, uh, implied that is a monoculture where everyone coalesces around a certain type of view. And this is where you have a link with social media. That because on social media, we can all create our own echo chambers. We follow who we want to follow. We only listen to the views we want to listen to. It is very easy for free speech to be constrained because you think that everyone should share the views of your monoculture. And that is something that could hamper free speech. And the third thing around diversity of viewpoint that I would mention is where you have people being limited to speaking solely within the silos of, the, of identity politics. So you're not allowed to speak outside the silos that have been set for you. So if you are a white man and you express an issue about racial politics, you're a white man, you're not allowed to engage in that debate. Now that, is, that sort of thing constrains free speech. You know, what would you know about gender and trans, uh, uh, transgender issues if you are a white, middle-aged, 50-year-old man? And just someone saying that is enough to condemn your views. Which should, that is not free speech. That is not proper debate. So that's the other thing that we're seeing, that people are being limited to the silos of identity politics. And when I open my, view, my mouth as a black conservative, you know, and if I said, uh, I said, oh, actually, I think that there are some good things that conservatives have done. I'll get someone hit it out of me. You are a disgrace to your color because as a black man, you're not allowed to express views that people do not think black men should express. And when people begin to do this, what you're effectively doing is narrowing the scope for free expression, which I believe should be at the heart of free speech and free debate. And so you have this ridiculous notion of if someone were to have a Chinese party, but they were sort of Anglo-Saxon. That's cultural appropriation, and that is unacceptable. Because you know, if you're not Chinese, you can't have a birthday party that is themed. Come to my birthday party; it's going to be Chinese themed. You're appropriating someone's culture. That is unacceptable. Or during the in the university debate around <coughs> un, uh, um, attainment of BME undergraduates, where there is an attainment gap uh, between BME ad, ad undergraduates on average and their white counterparts. And the answer has to be that's because the curriculum is too white, male, pale, and stale. Now, that's so everything begin, gets seen through the lens of identity politics rather than fact, and people are only allowed to engage in the silos that have been created for them by the monoculture. The final point I'll make, so the first one was rigor. We need rigor to have free speech. The second point is around diversity of viewpoint. The third one, which is the one that uh, Chloe touched on, which is civility. Too often what we find is people give offense quite easily, but also people take offense very easily. And that is something that is limiting the scope for debate because just the sheer fact that you've offended someone is enough for them sometimes to claim they want a retraction from you 
rather than to challenge the views that you have expressed. But I believe that we should have civility in order to have free speech. I, I, I don't have a problem with active protest. I think active protest is a good thing, but protest where it's designed to intimidate, protest where it's designed to stop someone else from expressing their views is unacceptable. And when you have senior politicians in this country saying, I want every conservative to feel uncomfortable about going on campus, that is setting the wrong example when it comes to civility. civility. That was what John McDonnell said. So if politicians in Westminster can't set the right example, then what do you expect to happen in our universities? So in short, my view is you shouldn't give offense for the sake of it, and you shouldn't take offense for the sake of it if we are going to have civility. But why is this important at universities? I believe that if university students do not learn to give and take, to express views and make up their own mind, but use things like no platform and trigger warnings, safe spaces, all of which were well intended when they were first introduced, but can now be used as a form of censorship with ideas you do not agree with, then who are going to be our peacemakers of the future, our lawyers of the future who can empathize and see the other side's perspective? And I believe that ultimately, if we don't solve this, our democracy would be worse for us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here and to be at Policy Exchange, which I have only been associated with for the last few weeks, and it's a wonderful place to work. And I'm working on um, uh, a study of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia today. Neither is a new subject, but there are new expressions of it. And uh, I'm particularly interested in that in, in, the, is, is, in both cases. Um, it's, there's very little that I can add to what uh, Chloe and Sam have already eloquently said, but I would like to stress a couple of slightly different things, perhaps, and also I'm afraid I'll probably be repetitive as well. I, I think that the freedom of the press and freedom of speech are under attack and under threat now, um, as never before in my lifetime anyway, and as you can see, I am, as uh, was just, Sam just said, male, pale, and stale. So I've been around quite a lot, and I think I've never seen such attacks as this. The, th the, the threats are political, religious, and cultural. They've always existed, such threats to freedom of speech, but I think their power and their danger to freedom is vastly amplified by social media and by the technologies of today. Um, it's a horrible uh, paradox, perhaps, that modern technologies make communication between us all much easier than it's ever been but instead of liberating us, they seem to be used, being used very often to stifle debate and dissent. And I think that really is important to resist in all ways. On the political level, the, I'm, I make no secret of saying, or no, no, I have no shame in saying that the greatest threat at the moment seems to come from the uh, Corbynist-led Labour Party. And, uh, make that, and they've now made that venerable party, of which my father was attorney general in the 1940s and president of the Board of Trade in the early 50s in the Attlee government. This, this is a completely different Labour Party now under Corbyn. It's one of the most rigid left-wing forces in the Western world. Jeremy Corbyn used his speech at the conference, in fact, to launch a direct attack on the British media. And he won loud applause for his assertion that, quotes, a free press has far too often meant the freedom to spread lies and half-truths and to smear the powerless, not to take on the powerful. He also encouraged Labour activists to challenge what he called the propaganda of privilege enjoyed by newspapers in Britain. Interesting phrase. And Corbynistas now, it's quite amusing, I suppose, or important to note, they're also now being encouraged to attack even the Guardian. The Guardian is not good enough for the Corbynistas. Happily, the Prime Minister took the opposite view at the United Nations last week and said, although she did not enjoy attacks on her in the press, the freedom of the press, quotes, is the bedrock of our democracy. And I think it's a matter of real concern that the Corbyn and those around him do not understand that. Second, apart from politics, is uh, after politics, is religion. As, uh, and religion and freedom of the press and expression have always been 
uh, point with of possible clashes in all cultures. And it certainly was true in uh, Judaism and in Christianity. And now I think the greatest problem is with Islamism and Islamist extremism. Um, I think that freedom of speech must and always uh, include, and uh, today as ever, an intrinsic right to cause offense. Uh, that excellent um, <coughs> uh, website Harry's Place has on its strap line, uh, f uh, freedom of speech means the right to offend other people. And it's, that includes the right to question not or to, and to criticize religious views. One shouldn't abuse believers, but to question the values and the effects of any religion seems to me to be absolutely essential to, do, to have that freedom. In 2015, after the deadly Islamist attacks in Paris, Pope Francis declared, I think very unfortunately, that it was wrong to provoke others by insulting their religion and that one could expect a reaction if one did that. The next day, David Cameron, Prime Minister at the time, rebutted the Pope, saying that he was a Christian and might be offended by offensive remarks about Jesus, but he defined, defended absolutely the right of anyone to criticize Christianity or any other religion. I think that's a really crucial um, point. And we now actually have to pay attention to the demands of the increasingly powerful Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or the OIC, which declares that, quotes, it is, the it, is, it is itself the largest, second largest intergovernmental organization after the United Nations, with a membership of 57 states over four continents. It's therefore quite important. And it claims to be the collective voice of the Muslim world, which I think many Muslims would dissent from. And its purpose, it says, is to encourage accurate and factual portrayal of Islam, that's in quotes, and to insist that the Western media avoid, quotes, any link or association of Islam with terrorism. And that's pretty strong stuff. Last June, the first Islamic European Forum, uh, sorry, this is the, the, the title of the group. Last June, the first, quotes, Islamic European Forum to examine ways of cooperation to curb hate speech in the media took place, interestingly, at the press club in Brussels. <clears throat> I think the idea that freedom of speech should be supervised by any hardline religious body is terrifying. Mm. It would be if it were doctrinaire Christians or doctrinaire Jews or anyone else demanding self, such self-censorship in the press. I think it might needs to be stressed again that whereas attacks on individual believers are quite improper, Examination of any religion must be allowed. It is not proper to dismiss all examination of Islamist extremism as Islamophobia. That is designed to inhibit discussion of any sort, and I think that is happening. I agree with Sam that we should publicize the horrors of, say, the war in Sudan, and we should not, and universities should not just concentrate on Israel Apartheid Week. That uh, seems to me a hugely um, a, 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 a terrible um, uh, inequality, if you like, of, of, of blame. Finally, cultural censorship. The cultural assaults in which Twitter mobs take hysterical aim at those whose views they dislike. Both Chloe and Sam have talked about that. There's no proportionality here very often, just anger, claims of hurt feelings and consequent attacks by digital mobs. <coughs> Alistair Heath, an, ex an excellent journalist, has pointed out that now, quotes, like in the witch hunts of yore, the burden of proof is reversed. You must prove that you're not guilty of offending others' hurt feelings, and that's impossible. When Victoria Atkins, the women's minister, said that she was a little cautious, in quotes, about the number of teenagers undergoing gender reassignment, buckets of gender reassignment treatment, bucket loads of abuse, she were just descended upon her. So also with Rabbi Sachs, who criticized Jeremy Corbyn's relationship towards Jews and Israel. In August, a trans-skeptical trans group on Merseyside distributed stickers saying, women don't have penises, <clears throat> and all hell broke loose. Twitter went into meltdown with the rage of trans people. This was not just a repetition of an Oxford English Dictionary definition, it was now a hate crime. The police felt impelled, impelled to make inquiries. More recently, this month, posters 
with the same statement of fact have had to be taken down. And feminists who gathered to discuss the Gender Recognition Act and the fact that it allows almost anyone to identify as a woman now are attacked, sometimes physically, and censored. As Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spiked, Spiked, wrote recently, anyone who turns up on campus to raise questions about transgender ideology can be expect to be no platformed by one cohort of the new moral guardians of our time. Very recently, Ian Baruma, the editor of uh, the New York Review of Books, was forced to resign last week, actually, because he had published an article by an alleged male sex offender who may have behaved very badly, but had not been convicted of any crime. And Baruma was forced to resign. And um, the, uh, Emily Bell, the excellent media writer in The Guardian, wrote an article about this entitled, Free Speech, Why No Editor Can Any Longer Publish and Be Damned. And as and, um, David is saying, am I going to close? I'm sorry, I am. Free speech, free speech I, I don't need to repeat it, but I'm going to repeat it. Free speech is absolutely <laughs> crucial to the ethics of Western democracy, to the very spirit of Western democracy. Without it, we're lost. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Um, I thought I'd start by um, going through a few of the abusive things on social media that I get sent. Um, so here's the list. I just had a little look through my Twitter before, and also because I'm sad, I sometimes save these things um, just to go over them later in the evening to get more angry. Um, so I've been called a disgrace, dishonest, scum, right-wing scum. I've been told to uh, go away and read Chomsky and find another career. <laughs> I've been uh, told that I'm uh, George Osborne's pet, Katie Hopkins, which is one of the most amazing things I think anyone's ever sent me. Um, more scum, um, more that I'm a disgrace, and more that I'm in a kind of elitist, um, you know, ivory tower, and I can't possibly understand what it's like in the real world. I also get sent letters. I think Chloe said some of, you know, some of the uh, old school stuff's the best. Um, and one of the letters that I've uh, sent recently was just someone saying, karma's going to get you, written in a, in a sort of scratchy ballpoint pen. Um, and the worst thing that I... And I'm not going to drop the C-bomb at a policy exchange, but I've been a, called a pro-Brexit C. <laughs> um, and this comes to me all the time over Twitter. It comes to me in my inbox, on my email, and, um, and then it comes through the post as well. And I think... One of the things I also wanted to point out is how misogynistic a lot of this abuse is. So something that I think me and my female colleagues share a lot, journalists who are sort of in their early 30s, is the tone and the different kinds of abuse you get if you're a woman compared to a man. And one of the things that happens to me quite a lot is being sent silly pictures. Um, so I'll get sent memes of, um, of a girl sometimes being told off um, or a girl with a silly face. Sometimes I get sent things that take, um, that criticise my voice, the way that I speak and my accent. Um, you can't really win, to be honest. I'm too posh, I'm thick, I'm stupid. It's all, you just can't win. So I think I've learned that you need to be much more robust and you need to just think Twitter's just going to do its thing and you need to build a little bit of armour and you need to not be so bothered by the things that come across your path. But something that it has done and which I do think is, is worrying, especially when it comes to freedom of speech, is there are some topics that I don't feel that comfortable going near anymore. Um, I feel really uncomfortable that if I'm going to talk about poverty or write about poverty or have any opinion on it at all, it automatically comes back to the fact, well, you, you can't possibly be, have any justification in talking about this. What do you know? How can you come from any point of authority to talk about it? And I want to scream back to people, you don't know anything about me, you don't know my background, you don't know where I'm from, but I can't. I've got to be dignified and really not engage on that. But I think that's really sad that, I've got, that I, I do think very much about what I tweet and the issues that I sometimes want to engage with and feel like I can't because people don't think I've got a voice um, of authenticity on it. Um, so I think a lot of this for me comes from the left. A lot of it, when, it's come, when it comes to taking, criticising me for, um, well, the criticism that's made against me for being a, like a girl, a little girl, you know, that tends to come from men. I hardly get any criticism from women at all. 
Um, but what I do get is a barrage of criticism from the left. And um, I do find what Corbyn said last week in his, um, in his conference speech a little bit chilling, to be honest. That, that point saying, you know, that you should maybe buy, bypass the mainstream media and go straight to social media to get your messaging. I found that um, quite worrying as a journalist. And I think there's no realisation out there that journalists are trained to critically evaluate information, legally trained. We know what you can and can't say. Um, we are able to make our own evaluations and judgments on material that goes out, and that's something that you're not going to get on social media. So I did listen to Corbyn's speech, and my ears pricked up at that part because I did find that the most, um, yeah, one of the most chilling things that he said. Um, I'm really sorry to hear, Chloe, that you were pursued down a dark alley <laughs> by people um, who didn't share your political view. Um, and I just think it's... Uh, I think my experience, Chloe's experience, as perhaps women um, who have a... Well, I have a very small public profile. Chloe's got a huge public profile. But it just shows how much stuff you've got to deal with every day. And uh, it gets in the way of what you want to do, which is tell great stories and report truthfully and accurately. And I'm sure for Chloe, it gets in the, in the way sometimes of uh, just trying to do your job. Um, so those are my comments. Um, and if anyone wants to call me um, a pro-Brexit anything, I'll just be uh, out there at the end. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, th thank you very much for, for all those contributions, um, uh, all of which I think came from interestingly different angles. Um, and I mean, I think one of the one of the underlying arguments that we could perhaps tease out a bit now is, I mean, do we think that that, that new norms are going to emerge? Uh, as I said right at the beginning, this is extraordinarily recent. The, these new forms of communication, in particular, um, are, are are kind of new. Um, more civil norms going to emerge spontaneously, or do we need the role of um, of the state? Uh, do we need to to, to um, clamp down more on um, abuse and incivility? Indeed, what do we worry mo mm. more about? Do we worry more about abuse and incivility, or do we worry more about censorship, as uh, as as William perhaps implied? Um, I mean, uh, just in the today's Observer, Jamie Bartlett, um, who writes about these issues. Um, um, he was in a debate with, with Jez Phillips, and he said that um, the number of arrests for online abuse is actually rising very sharply at the moment. And should we welcome that, or, or should we be worried by that? Um, I don't know if, um, if you want to respond briefly um, to, 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 the, your, to the other speakers, as it were, very briefly, and then we will throw it open. I'll, I'll just add something, um, a little something, actually, to, to what you just said there, Dave. And, I mean, I, th I think the place that I come from with this is that actually we we do uh, have a we do have ways in which we define our debate. We do do that as a society, and specifically as a democracy. So, what it means to be a democracy is that regularly, periodically, you have a defined debate, and you do that for one very very good reason, which is that you choose the whole country gets to choose uh, who governs it. That that's obviously what a, a, an election is. Um, so I think in that context, it is quite right that we every so often stand up for uh, the principles that, that we want to see, the standards that we want to see applied to that kind of interaction. Uh, I mean, I'm, I made reference earlier on to a, to a, uh, a thing that I'm, a, a, a reform I'm hoping to make that I, I hope will contribute in a positive way to, to those standards that we expect uh, in our democracy, and, and, I, and I hope I outline clearly enough why we want to do that. We want to do that because actually it's for it, it's the voters that this matters for. People should be able to uh, go to their polling booth uh, and, and cast their vote in a peaceful way and in a way that reflects whatever they want it to, to do. That is what their vote is for. But crucially, we have to set the, set the conditions for how they can do that in a peaceful uh, and free manner. And that is what it means to... To, to live in uh, live in a live in a democracy that's really fundamentally important and, and I guess I also think it's rather important to to take action in, in that sense I mean I I also touched in my remarks on on the, the you know the bigness of some of these issues and the the intractability of some of them and I think we've all come to to, to touch on that in our in our remarks um, this evening but actually let's not let that stand in the way that sometimes we have to take action Sometimes we have to make that very difficult move from the sphere of philosophy 
into getting something done that makes it uh, better the way in which we live in a democracy. Well, thanks. Um, uh, the, the other panellists can come back um, uh, in response to the uh, questions, but um, let, let's open it up and <coughs> a, a few um, comments, questions, say, say who you are. Um, the, 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 the guy in the white jacket actually was first. Thank you very much. Can you? On. Can you? Okay. Well, just shout. Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Um, yeah, there, and then the yep. lady at the back. My name is Paul Towson, uh, Chairman of Policy Forum in Orpington, uh, in Kent. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear you talking about was the what I would describe as a kind of mission creep in some of our institutions. Um, for example, the police in terms of so-called hate crime. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the way that the police seem to be focusing more and more on, on speech rather than actual crime. Um, thinking of the uh, South Yorkshire police incident, uh, asking people to report non-crime incidents of hate. Uh, this seems to be going far beyond uh, what they need to. Um, other institutions are really, like our social media platforms, Google, YouTube, Twitter and so on, uh, <coughs> that are increasingly censoring views that are disapproved of. And there's a lot of suspicion amongst conservatives that conservative views are being pushed down. That's very concerning. And I really don't know what the answer is in terms of whether it's right to regulate or whether we simply need more competition. Um, I, I simply don't know, but, um, but I think it's a problem. Okay, um, the lady there and then we'll... Then we'll um Claudia, Claudia the Centenary Action Group, a cross-party coalition of women in politics and women activists get more women in politics and we are cross-party the very nature of it from all sides of the political spectrum and I don't think we would I don't think when we initially started the coalition we thought we'd be able to come together in the way that we had um, but one of the issues that has united us from left to right is the issue of online abuse which is just coming at women from all sides and Kate yeah Kate like you said um, very misogynistic very much being targeted that because you're a woman and you're speaking out and you're raising your head above the parapet and I agree with everything that about free speech, but I think what we're really doing is, is this crossing the line, it's the digital model, it's women politicians themselves being put out on sites and saying, go, go and attack this feminist, go and, go and show her what's what. And that's something that we're finding very troubling. And I've just come from the Girl Guiding meeting um, where the stats have shown that it's one of the main things that puts young women and young girls off getting into politics and taking up leadership positions. And I think it really is an issue with um, social media. So I'm very interested to um, other than the consultation, how the government is engaging with social media companies to regulate this kind of digital mob trends that we're seeing emerging. Okay, j just one more in this round and then uh, we'll, we'll um, ask the panellists to respond to... Uh, just here. Uh, Joanna Williams, Policy Exchange. Um, one thing that concerns me about this discussion in general, as well as some of the contributions we've heard today, is a, a blurring of the lines between abuse, incivility, and criticism. And I think it's really important that we have a very firm idea of, of where the boundary lies between abuse and criticism. And I think particularly when we live in a, a culture where um, criticism is so readily interpreted as a personal attack um, on your existential sense of self, and we're so readily assuming that people are vulnerable nowadays and can't withstand um, criticism in any way, shape, or form, the boundary between abuse and criticism uh, becomes very readily blurred. So, Kate, I hate to say it, but I have had directed at me every single thing that you've mentioned, but I've not interpreted any of it as abuse. 
I've, I've taken it as criticism and I've either deleted it or forgotten all about it very readily. I think the more we interpret this, these um, uh, criticisms as abuse and present ourselves as being abused, it only can lead to cause for greater regulation of social media. Um, for me, one of the most bizarre things of the past 12 months has been Amnesty International uh, launching a campaign to protect women on the internet, you think this is a, a campaign which is looking at t people being tortured abroad and it's turning its attention to women using the internet in wealthy Western countries. I, I find it bizarre. I also find it incredibly offensive and patronizing that the internet should be cleaned up in my name as a woman. Um, I think social media is the public square nowadays and we need to err on the side of making speech in the public square as open and as free as possible. Um, can you respond to any any you want to, not all. Um, okay, yeah, we have for a while. For the, uh, I think is it David from Running Media? I'll take uh, your question yeah. first, and yeah. I think I'll be very worried to for us to use the strong arm of the state to promote free speech. I, I think that that it, it seems to me like a contradiction in terms. But also, you've always got to think, even if you could do it, uh, further ahead. You know what would happen if. Uh, one day, you know, as much as we want conservatives to be in government uh, forever, there is a Labour government, and they decided to use university funding to promote something else that they thought was more valuable than this. It's not something that we'll be happy with. So I don't think we go there um, at all. But there is, there is something we can do, and that we are doing. Um, I'm working with the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Charity Commission and the new regulator, the Office for Students, to produce new guidance which will be published um, in sort of the next sort of month or so on the rules around no platforming, safe spaces and what free speech actually means because it, often what you're having is you're having lax, you're getting people yeah. using lax interpretation of the law say around hate crime to say that person is a fascist <coughs> and they're fascist because I really disagree with what they said so we should no platform them so I think new guidance that we can get all these stakeholders to sign up to and then promote to university societies and to university institutions will make a big difference. I think in the long term, one of the things that we should be looking at is proper encourage debate and discussion within the school system. If people grow up within the school system having debates and discussion, swapping views, taking a point of view that you don't agree with and having to argue it, then you're more likely to get people who do not readily give or take offense because um, they think that's a view that they find unacceptable. And that is why I think free speech at universities is so important, but also we need to look at it within the school system. The other point I'll make uh, quickly, the point that uh, Chloe responded to is, in the broad scheme of things, certainly from a university perspective, we're not as bad as in the US, right? In the US, you've got what they call microaggressions, and if you say, God bless you to the wrong person, that's the wrong way to use your free expression. We're not there at all. But there is certainly some kind of global epidemic around new platforming, where in, I was in, uh, in New Zealand, where the former head of the New Zealand Federal Reserve, so well-respected pol uh, politician, um, had been leader of the National Party, was no platform simply because he questioned affirmative action policy. And that was unacceptable for some students. So there is kind of this global wave around no platforming, people putting their, uh, metaphorically, putting their fingers in their ears to views they just don't want to listen to. I think the best way that we protect ourselves um, in this country is to make it very clear all the time what is within the law and what is not within the law. Because often when people object or try to in, uh, introduce censorship, they are operating outside the law and we should call that out. And that's the way to change culture, I believe. Mm. Great, thanks. Uh, Kate's got to go, so I was going to... Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, um, so my, you know, the, the list of things that I read out, I mean, it was a difference between a, an opinion, but in my some uh, people's opinion of me and some things which I would say is abusive and for me I always think if you couldn't say it to somebody's face directly then it doesn't mean that it's okay to say it on Twitter so particularly being sworn at I, I don't think that's okay at all because that's not something you'd really do to someone in 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 real life um and also I'm pleased if some women can withstand it and I'm you know if good on them but I think there needs to be a realization that 
what is happening on Twitter is over the last few years is, is completely um, different to anything, let's say, as a journalist, you would have had to have coped with um, even five years ago. Because five years ago, you might have eventually got a letter maybe through the post in a week's time that would have been printed on the letters page. You certainly wouldn't have had an instant reaction and something you know that can be quite brutal and quite harsh directly to you. Because I don't think that is criticism. I think that is knee-jerk and over-the-top. And I think that's something that social media facilitates. So the idea that you know women, women need to you know, be tougher about this or stop kind of portraying themselves in a vulnerable way, I just don't agree with. And you know, good on anyone who can who just brushes it off, but I think you need to understand that for, for lots of people it's very discouraging for them to take a role in public life at all. Okay, well, we'll just t take two or three more questions and then come back um, for final comments from up here. Um, the gentleman in the front row here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Mrs. Lancaster, I'm an academic. Um, one of these days, I'm going to stand up at a university seminar and say scientifically, I don't believe in transgender. Um, one, one of these, I am, I am going to do that, watch this space. My question, though, to the panel is, what is your reaction to the controversy around Boris Johnson's article, in which, to my mind, he said which absolutely one? nothing controversial the, the whatsoever. The Burger one, you mean? Yes, and defended... Yeah what is at the very heart of our liberal Western civilization, is it therefore rather worrying that the reaction he got was not from the usual idiots at the extremes, but came from a lot of mainstream people at all, who therefore s appear not to understand the basic values of a liberal society? Good point. Um, um, lady at the back and the, and the guy in the blue shirt. Thank you. Um, Katie Bourne, I'm a police and crown commissioner and the one in Sussex. So having experienced, it's a shame Kate's gone. I came into politics just under six years ago and have experienced terrible abuse online. And I think we, we do have a potential problem here getting more women involved. But my question to the panel is, do you think the laws are strong enough? We heard a gentleman there questioning about the police running around over hate crime. I do see the other side of this. But do you think our laws are strong enough? Clyde Wettiger, Hampstead in Kilburn. Really just following on from that last uh, question. Uh, Kate was saying that uh, most people on the panel could really stand up for themselves. But there are many thousands of people out in the country who are not in that position to stand up for themselves yes. when they're exposed to this sort of thing. Uh, so I wonder whether the law is lagging behind, you know, quite a way lagging behind what needs to be done. The only option, <coughs> if uh, people are the victim of this sort of attack on social media, is to try and get material taken down, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, there was a, a church recently uh, where there was a social media campaign accusing them of nefarious goings-on, all untrue. Uh, members of the congregation were hounded out of the service. And eventually... The people who were responsible, the, 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 the legal position was so poor that they were actually prosecuted under something called the Ecclesiastical Courts Jurisdiction Act of 1853, because there wasn't actually anything in the, in the legal arsenal, the legal toolkit, that was fit for purpose. So the question really following on from this lady is, maybe there is an opportunity for leadership in terms of government here to put forward a new legal framework that will right. protect so not only politicians, but the vast majority of people out in the country. Okay, mm -hmm. a couple more very quick ones. Um, lady at the back there. There's a couple of points, actually. Uh, one is, uh, sure, it's a matter of education. You get, if it's people learn in school that what you put online is the same as actually saying to someone's face. At the moment, it's a disconnect, a big disconnect. You feel isn't you're anonymous, no one can see you. It's like sort of throwing stones over the, over the fence. Whereas if you can uh, equate it to actually standing up in front of somebody and saying it to their face, that might just put a different complexion on it. And um, <laughs> I'd like to uh, give a shout out for, for trans people. We're, we're not all... Um <laughs> Thank you.
but, but too many of us are too easily affected. I would agree with that 100%. Right. Okay. A uh, uh, cu couple more very quick ones, this guy here. You've been waiting and... Uh, um, I think one of the... So quick. I'm Steve, I'm from the University of Exeter. I think one of the big misconceptions that come up a lot about universities especially is that universities are exceptionally sen censorious as opposed to student unions or people using the language of student unions, whether it's vague codes of conduct or language of no platform, you need to go well beyond what um, is established in order to make um, these censorship take place, essentially. Uh, and I was wondering why if I made it in a very specific policy point, why is it that student unions, uh, free speech regulation, or stu student unions can be much more censorious than universities? Why is that discrepancy uh, allowed to continue? Okay, quick, 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 uh, very quick one over there. And very quick one over there. Hi, Will from Dorset. Um, Sam said about this being a global problem. Uh, I'd just like to gently challenge that and suggest it's a Western problem, where there are people that say, Fair actually, enough. We don't accept some of the bedrock of Western civilization. Um, so we know platform people, we, we say free speech isn't the, the way forward for conversations. And I just wanted to see whether that might be the better way of diagnosing that. Okay, well, the, the lady over there quickly. Jen Person, Defend Digital Me. We work for Children's Digital Rights. We welcome Sam's um, review with the uh, Human Rights Commission on um, the perhaps the transparency over no platforming. Will you extend that also to um, the refusals under the Prevent program around sort of people declined uh, to participate at, at, at uh, university level and further consider using it um, to review what's going on in schools? Our research shows about 70% of schools are now using safeguarding software which blocks and filters children's use of the internet. So they're they're monitored for every, every word that they key type has been monitored both in school and at home. And uh, free speech is therefore um, not uh, as being chilled in effect because they're not able to use uh, about 20,000 words which are flagging them as potential risks of gang membership, suicide and all sorts of things that may not be right. Okay. So we'd like to see that uh, review extended down to schools. Very final. Um is it, to what extent does the panel, it's more like policy exchange, to what extent does the panel think that the law relating to trade disputes and picketing and demonstrating outside of residences uh, should be reviewed and to what extent it, could it be um, regulated in a more formal way than it is at the moment? Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> For, fortunately, there are lots of questions. Pick I, can, I, can and pick, I can pick and choose. <laughs> Um, well, firstly, thank you very much uh, for standing up and um, expressing uh, your view. I don't think I caught your name. Paula. Paula. And um, I think that was a terrific example of what I would call civility because what the gentleman over here said is something that in some other context of debate could have caused offence and could have been a real issue. And not that I disagree, he has a right to say it, but I think you responded very much in the spirit that we would want a debate like this to carry on. So thank you uh, for standing up. Um, the issue of sort of Boris Johnson and the burqa is a, an instrument. I think it's at one level free speech. He was able to say it. He can express himself, and um, quite you know uh, that it's perfectly within his rights uh, to do so. I suspect where the um, criticism was was that as a political tactic. It was playing to one audience and trying to get people to react in a certain way. And that's what provoked the reaction. Now, we moved on from that. You know, he, Boris has said his thing, but I'm just trying to explain why <coughs> I think the reaction was there. It's obviously he's clearly entitled to say it, but when a senior politician says that, playing to a certain political base, you should, you should definitely expect other people who disagree with you to react in one way or another. Um, student unions and why they have, seem to have a lot of latitude in this space. The student unions have got this expression that they call freedom from harm, which they use uh, this part of the, uh, as a sort of a, a policy of theirs. And freedom from harm is not a legal concept, and it's a very elastic concept, so you can apply to almost anything. And that means that the NUS can decide that they were going to no platform someone on the basis that they will cause harm to others. And this is, the, this is what is really problematic in the culture here that there are some people who see speech they disagree with 
as almost violent and therefore has to be stopped. And that's the kind of thing that's w that leads you to no platform in ideas that you disagree with, simply <coughs> because you disagree with them. Now, we're looking at new guidance, as I said to, uh, as I said earlier on, and we will look to clarify all of these terms. Now, the, stu the student union doesn't fall under the law for this particular policy, but other student bodies do, and so do universities, so we'll look to clarify that. Definitely in schools, a lot more that we can do, but I don't have responsibility for schools, which is why um, I didn't dwell on that. And the uh, final point, is the law catered, is the law strong enough? From where I sit, you know, and it's purely from a university perspective, there's actually quite a lot of law around free speech. And that's not said, and I don't, not really think the law around online promotion. And if anything at all, what's happening is universities are boxed between all the laws we've got, many of which were passed during the time of the last Labour government, and students. And they kind of don't know which way to turn. So racial equality laws, harassment laws, hate laws, public sector d uh, equality duty. There's quite a lot of law around free speech um, in this country. Sorry. Right. Uh, a, a quick fire, a quick fire attempt to, to sum up some of these some of these themes. Um, starting with the question of whether our laws are strong enough. Uh, I mean, I did open by by outlining a, a place where I do hope to 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 improve the law. So there's there's one example, but actually. Something that I think has already been concluded in this sphere by the Committee on Standards in Public Life, a very good report, cross-party consensus to have a look at it, um, is that actually one thing that might maybe more for focusing on here is, if you like, consistency of application. So, uh, Katie, I'm sure you, you know this from the position of being a, a PCC, but, you know, there's 40 of you across the country uh, and likewise 40 police forces, and, and that inherently means you're going to get difference. Now, I'm not starting a huge police reform argument from here from this, this, this table tonight, but what I am just saying is that that means people are going to have somewhat different experiences across the country, and that might be something worth taking a look at. Um, uh, Paula, what is true in uh, civility is also true legally, uh, which is that what's illegal uh, offline uh, is the same online, and, and we should just hold to that as a, as a basic principle here. It really does underpin a lot of what we are talking about. Now, what that also means, though, let's not forget is that the stringent thresholds that we want to see applied in our uh, criminal law should also be applied, I think, to, uh, to what we um, hope to have dealt with uh, online. So, so let's, let's, let's remember the stringency, actually, of our criminal law and the thresholds involved in that. That is actually quite important here as well. Moving on from there, just to a quick point about critical thinking. I mean, I think this is something that perhaps goes to what you might say in front of a room full of girl guides or uh, in, in, a, in a school situation. You know, let's take this chance to try to help our young people develop those faculties because that is one of the ways in which people need to take care of themselves, uh, which is being able to, to distinguish critically between what you, what you hear. Going from there to the uh, infamous Boris Johnson article, uh, critical thinkers and readers will have noticed that he said many things inside one article uh, if they got behind the paywall. Um, and I do rather hope that people drew their own conclusions uh, from that. Um, I also happen to think that actually freedom of speech equals freedom of dress. Uh, so that was my response to the substance of what he was saying there. Um, just, just drawing to a close, I mean, let's be proud of our Western democratic heritage here. We have something immensely precious that we are very, very fortunate to live under. And let's keep with that. Let's keep that going. Let's look at the threats that uh, appear to come to it. But let's stick to some of those principles uh, and seek to defend uh, the, the, the fact that we have a democratic space and we can all participate in it. That is very, very precious. Thank you, Chloe. Very brief final word, William. Well, I, I've already spoken too much. Um, I, th I, th I think that everybody's been fascinating and I've enjoyed this session incredibly. I would just say that a, society, a country in which Jermaine Greer, one of the greatest mm. feminists of our time, should be no platformed. There's something very wrong with that. Mm. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all very much for coming. I think we've managed to have a relatively um, civilised so, debate with, yeah, with some disagreement. Um, thank you, and um, can you say thank you to all the people on the panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.